sexual health is quite a broad um, definition that includes a lot. It includes, like you say, the physical, the emotional, the mental, the social aspects of well-being, but in relation to your sexuality, maybe anxiety. Because I just think that um, anxiety has an interesting relationship with sexuality anyway. Um, because arousal is sort of that sweet spot of anxiety that like there's a, the arousal of the unknown. The separation rates with, in couples where there is a cancer diagnosis is actually really similar to the general population. So they're not separating any more than the general population is. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new edition of Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis interview series. Today, we are gonna, going to talk about uh, an important and, um, let's say, intimate subject uh, that uh, affects us all. Uh, and um, it will, for sure, it will be a lot of questions. And we are going to talk about sexual health in adults with cancer with our guest, Sarah. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. How are you? Everything okay? Good, thank you. Hi. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk about this. Yeah, it is a subject that, um, as I mentioned, it affects us, but um, not all of us uh, have maybe the courage or for us it's uh, the the sentiment of shame to ask some questions or to find out so uh, these uh, uh, things um, may lead to to some um, uh, bad uh, uh, events uh, even more if you are diagnosed with uh, with cancer uh, as we all know, uh, sexual function is a vital aspect of quality of life among adults. And this, despite the fact that uh, it's a psychological, uh, psych uh, physical need, uh, it has also uh, psychological factors that contribute to sexual health. Uh, what I want to ask you first uh, from your point of view, if you can give us a definition or to explain for our audience in, let's say, normal terms, what sexual health means and what is optimal sexual function. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it's maybe, um, like you say, it can be a bit of a taboo or stigmatizing topic. So it can be a bit difficult to find out what all the different terms mean, but sexual health is quite a broad um, definition that includes a lot. It includes, like you say, the physical, the emotional, the mental, the social aspects of well-being, but in relation to your sexuality. Um, that does include also function, of course, but um, not it's not only function, that's really only one part of it, because sexual health is also um, your sexual rights, which I can go into in a minute. It's But being sure that these are respected, that you can experience pleasure, that you can experience satisfaction, um, and that sexuality is also something that's positive for you. Um, so the rights are that means like your right to um, experience sex free of coercion, for example, your right, right to experience pleasure, but also things like your right to choose to marry or to choose how many children you want without anyone influencing that. Um, and most importantly, maybe is your right to education and to information. Um, so actually without that right you can't have like a productive sexual health which I think is very interesting when you get into subjects about sex education um sexual function that's just one part of sexual health um of course an important part and maybe something that we focus on um so that you could define as um I think it's the absence of difficulty moving through the stages of sexuality so that's uh desire arousal and orgasm 
Um, so if you can move through those stages without any difficulty, then you would have optimal sexual function. Um, but something that's kind of up and coming a little bit is using instead of these separate terms is using the term sexual well-being, because that just emphasizes the fact that even without optimum sexual function, sexual function, we can um, perceive our sex lives to still be satisfying because sexual well-being is then the evaluation that we have of our sex life. So even if we do experience a difficulty with desire or with orgasm or something, if our if we still experience pleasure, if our sexual rights are still met um, and we're still having fun and enjoyment, then you can have satisfying sexual well-being. So there's a lot going on, but it's kind of up to you to define it for yourself a little bit. I understand. You mentioned about sexual health education and the term right. Yeah. It's like a right of yeah. individual. Yeah, like uh, a human right to yeah, have access right. to yeah. information. Yeah. Nowadays, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, issues regarding human rights, human security. And uh, I can't think about uh, cultural background. Uh, regarding uh, sexual health as a right in some uh, close societies. So yeah. uh, I guess uh, it is a term or a notion that need, needs to be on the front lines from now on, because uh, when we are talking about rights and we are talking about sexuality in terms of pleasure, uh, in some societies, uh, they are not match. <laughs> uh, no, if you no. understand what uh, what I mean, so it um, uh, it uh, necessity uh, an important cultural background, and uh, yeah. you you should be very open to yeah. this kind of uh, let's say because... not activity but well being. Yeah, yeah, because it's also not only providing information is providing correct information so there's also a lot of cultures where maybe they are talking about it but it's not um scientifically correct i'm thinking maybe um to more conservative schools where they're providing sex education where of abstinence only um that the only way to not get pregnant or to not have stis is to never engage in sex true but there are other options um yeah, and then there's cultures, of course, that don't speak about sex at all. Um, and this can cause a lot of problems later. It can cause most, most, maybe most significantly is the other sexual rights that aren't, can't be um, adhered to either because people don't know if you're not provided with the information, you then don't know that you have the right to um, have sex without coercion. You don't know what consent means. You don't know what pleasure can be like that you have the right to pleasure and how that feels in your body. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of step one of everything else. It, it is very important indeed, because uh, as I told you before the interview, I have uh, two kids, a boy and a girl. And uh, I don't know why uh, regarding the boy, I'm not so concerned, but uh, regarding my daughter, uh, as she grows up, I... I became more and more concerned. So also in Romania, they, they started to implement for the moment, like a social uh, a movement, this uh, uh, intention to introduce uh, sexual health uh, courses, uh, but it's very difficult to, to break a close society like us, but if for parents, like me, it will be very useful because uh, there, there are questions that uh, you mentioned before that I, I can't answer, you know, yeah. so uh, I, I, I just can't answer from my own experience. But uh, now the society is such in a, in a movement. So every day it's a, like a new day, totally different. It's not uh, seems like was yesterday. So uh, and I, I, I can't keep going with the evolution so it, it it is a really neat and except the cultural background what are other conditions or situations that affect sexual health and how we can manage these issues yeah um 
it's interesting you say you can't you can't answer the questions because it's so sex is something that impacts us all um which I think is an interesting part of psychology because we study things like depression and anxiety so much but maybe not everyone will be impacted by depression and anxiety whereas every single living person um even if you identify as asexual you will be impacted by sex and yet we don't talk about it as much I think it's yeah it's interesting um so and sex it impacts everything and everything is impacted by sex it's very like multifaceted and it, it combines it's, together it's a paradox you know yeah a, a, yeah a, everybody like it's doing but uh, in the same time not in the right way but it's not only the act that that counts and we see a lot of issues a lot of problems after uh, yeah. a, con a sexual contact especially nowadays with a lot of uh, social media influences so uh, yes it, it, it is very very difficult to to manage yeah. this, this thing. yeah and there's a lot of things that um that are Im impacting our sex lives and whether we're having a satisfying sex life so um because yeah it can be impacted by things like social media the social social sphere and our um uh, cultures that we're spending time in but it can also be impacted by um your physical body if you any medical illnesses it can be impacted by your relationship um, and by your mental well-being so things like um your body image is also something that we're talking about more with with the use of social media but those who maybe have a uh, a worse uh, worse self-esteem or a poor body image um they may avoid sex they may not uh, to their partner to see them without clothes on they may not have so much desire to have sex anymore um then you've also got things like if you've got relational tensions like um stress in your relationship um and that could be from communication issues it could be from children and and having job stress stress tends to also decline our desire for sex it can also reduce the satisfaction that we're having during sex um, you've also got then things like mental health um, issues which can impact sex so things like if you do have um, depression it's quite common for people with depression not have very high desire and another paradox is the medications that we tend to give to people with depression also impact your sexual um, well-being that can impact your ability to have an erection or to reach orgasm um, and impact your arousal actually as well so yeah, like it's very very many layers to it um and then you've got the medical sphere so things like um chronic illnesses like diabetes and cardiovascular problems that can impact blood flow so that could uh, make erections very difficult or it could prevent um sufficient lubrication um but that could also change your nerve um sensations that can cause nerve damage and things like that which could make um the sensations that were once pleasurable very painful um or the other way around and then you've got things like the hormonal changes so you could think menopause but this is also very relevant to cancer of course um because when you go through hormonal changes your sexual body is going to change um yeah i think cancer is maybe quite a sort of nice example for summarizing it all because everything I've mentioned, cancer impacts. It's so holistic. Um, so you've got all of those things. You've got the fatigue, you've got the nerve damage, you've got the stress, uh, the mental health issues, and all of those things will individually and combined impact your sex life. Uh, you mentioned uh, also, and you talk about uh, more about uh, psychological factors. And you mentioned cancer. In uh, psychology, when we discuss about the uh, impact of cancer diagnosis, the first emotion is fear. And uh, this is like a common uh, fear, a common emotion for every uh, oncological patient. And fear is <laughs> the only negative emotion out of uh, all emotion. But in um, the case of um, uh, sexual health, when uh, one of the partners are diagnosed with uh, with uh, cancer, which emotion will be dominant, or which is the first instinct, let's say, that uh, the cancer patient uh, feels or 
experience and also for his uh, caregiver or uh, partner? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. And I think the one that comes to my mind is it's very related to fear, but it would be maybe anxiety. Because I just think that um, anxiety has an interesting relationship with sexuality anyway. Um, because arousal is sort of that sweet spot of anxiety that like there's the arousal of the unknown, um, but not too much because then that then destroys our arousal. Um, and I think when we talk about cancer, we can see that fear, anxiety and everything. And I think that really relates with sexual health. Um, because you have things like, go back to body image, um, the anxiety of how our body is going to change, um, the anxiety of will my partner still find me attractive? Uh, will I? Will my body function sexually the same as it did before? Or how will those changes feel? Um, what will my sex life look like? You've got then the, the anxiety of the future is, is this change in my sex life permanent? Is this change in my relationship permanent? Um, you could then have anxiety from avoiding sex, which is very common because then you get, um, it builds it up and it can become something that's got a lot of pressure behind it. and Or maybe things like performance anxiety as well, if um, sex is, uh, has changed or has not been something you've done very recently, or if you feel... Um, that your body looks different or is performing differently, there can be a lot of um, stress on how you're doing while, while you're having sex instead of experiencing the pleasure together. Um, you've then got things like thinking like pain during cancer um, and having anxiety of, of having pain during sex, which is again, a very like mutually um, exclusive or, or mutually um, mutually relational, I guess they impact each other um cuz you can pain can cause anxiety but having anxiety about feeling pain can cause pain um many women could develop vaginismus and things after cancer because of the anxiety of experiencing pain again and then i think it's also maybe the most apparent in the partner because the partner has so many stresses and so many uncertainties I mean, am i being a good enough caregiver um, will me touching my partner hurt them? Can I touch them intimately? Do they want that? The fear of rejection, I think, can be huge. Um, if a partner wants to engage in an act of intimacy, but they're not sure that the partner with cancer can cope with that, wants that, can do it, can feel it, um, that can be really stressful. And then I think there's a lot of um, anxiety about the shame of even wanting to have sex. You know, my, my partner has cancer and I'm sat here worrying about um, about sex and about when we're next, next, next going to be intimate. And that can make people feel very selfish and make people feel very anxious about that, um, which is totally not necessary, but is understandable. Yes. Uh, and uh, now we are going, in my opinion, to another paradox, um, because uh, we are talking about couples. And uh, now we, uh, in this situation, uh, also about families. And um, <laughs> the paradox is that, uh, as I mentioned before, the society is progressing, yeah? Uh, and uh, we evolve very, very much. But in the same time, uh, it's like sex be uh, become the most important things on the relations, even though there are other things that we've learned to be more important. So uh, this uh, uh, cancer diagnosis can end the relation, in your opinion, or can end the family life? Yeah, um, from the research that I've read, because I was really interested in this actually when doing my own research, um, the separation rates with, in couples where there is a cancer diagnosis is actually really similar to the general population. So they're not separating any more than the general population is. But in the separations that do happen um, when someone has cancer, 
it's uh, six to eight times more likely to be the woman who was diagnosed with cancer, um, which I just think is an alarming statistic, but also an interesting statistic, because it does suggest to me that um, it's the men when they are uh, when they are the caring partner, when they're the person that needs to care for their yeah, other yeah, other yeah, partner. Yeah. yeah, the caregiver. Thank you. Um, they maybe maybe we need to support them more. Maybe they need um, the space to share their emotions more. Maybe they need help with how to be that partner, with how to be intimate with their partner with um, with cancer. Um, how to fit into that role. Uh, so yeah, I just think it's a really interesting statistic, but there needs to, of course, be more research done onto why exactly. But um, I think when the separations are happening, ca cancer might be the catalyst. It might be the thing that triggers it. But mostly there has already been some existing tension or existing problems in the relationship. Um, and there's, of course, a lot of people when they have been diagnosed with cancer, um, and particularly when they've survived it, they can really have this new outlook on life. This new, like, I've been given a second chance, I want to embrace it. And maybe that can also be a catalyst for ending that relationship that you weren't fully happy in. Um, or yeah, having that confidence to be like, I'm going to do something new, I'm going to change. So I think that could be the catalyst, but usually there is already something going on. Uh, also, uh, me or even you as uh, a specialist or uh, being involved in uh, relations, uh, being married, uh, I, I don't believe in also in what you mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, cancer diagnosis just uh, can end uh, direct relation. Uh, it, it, it is for sure something going on during the relations and cancer might be only the reason or the, uh, let's say, plausible reason or the elegant reason for the other part just to to get out for the relations that, uh, however, didn't didn't uh, uh, went uh, well. Uh, of course, we are not judging people. We just uh, we are here to to have these hard conversations for everyone who are listening and wants to find out more about uh, how important or not is sex in uh, relations. And uh, according to this, um, uh, the philosopher Nietzsche said very, very <laughs> beautiful that it is not a lack of love, but a lack of friendship that makes some happy marriages. Um, do you think that the friendship, it is, uh, we can regard it as a coping strategies? Because we all know after a cancer diagnosis, we try to find out coping strategies, especially positive ones. So friendship yeah. might be a coping strategies. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think it's um, yeah a very beautiful quote, and um, I think it's true always. But maybe something that becomes more apparent during cancer, um, because the other parts of relationship can um, can struggle during this time. And I think something like friendship, which includes for me anyway, I think that includes communication. It includes still intimacy and closeness, um, but maybe an intimacy that doesn't involve sex. Um, and I think that that's such a powerful tool um, during cancer, but but always. Um, so I definitely think it's a coping strategy. I think it allows people to, to work together as a team during a really difficult time and yeah it, it, that closeness that that feeling of touch the um like a, a supportive partner can really help with not feeling so isolated anymore it can help the acceptance of the diagnosis it can help with the rehabilitation into life again afterwards um i think it's a really important and powerful tool that we that we really embrace yeah yeah to to be friends more than uh, because you know we all know that love's uh, not past, but uh, during time when you enter in the routine after, yeah. let's say, 10, 15 years of not marriage, but also after uh, 10, 15 years of a relations, uh, if you are not uh, friends, uh, the first of obstacle means the, fir the first breakup. So 
it uh, it is very important to to be friends to remain friends and uh, so on uh we are not still uh have met very much time so i would like to ask you like the final questions that i believe everyone is interested in uh, how can i have uh, Safe sex during treatment or after treatment? I guess this is the most important questions of all of them before. Yeah. Um, so my first thing would be uh, feel your body, listen to your body. Sex should never be painful. If there is pain, stop, do something different, try something different. Sex should be pleasurable. Um, hand in hand with that, sex is not penetration. Um, the very it's a very heteronormative idea that sex needs to be penile vaginal penetration, and it's completely not true. You define what sex is for you. Um, if that is just an act of self exploration, if it's an act of intimate touch, it could just be a game, fun. It could be a cuddle. Like you get to decide. Um, with that said. Your immune system could be weakened due to treatments. So it is very advisable to wear condoms and use lubrication because that can just prevent any irritations or tears and, and infections, things like that. Even if it's your usual partner, it's just safer to use these. Um, and I think with that as well, manage the symptoms that you're experiencing, the side effects that you have. So uh, chemotherapy and hormonal therapy can cause vaginal dryness. So use lubrication, use a vaginal um, moisturizer, because that can prevent pains and tears and things like that it can just make sex more pleasurable for you. If you have um, low energy levels and fatigue, you can incorporate that in so you can be very mindful of that. So things like choosing a position where you get to lay down and relax a bit more. Um, and you can, again, incorporate that into the sexual play. You can experiment with your partner with finding props and pillows that mean your body is in the right position for you to feel the pleasure without having to exert any energy. Um, I think as well, hugely in this is use toys. I think these are widely under acknowledged. Sexual toys are fan a fantastic tool. Um, Things like a dildo can really take the pressure off anybody who's struggling with erectile dysfunction. Um, from nerve damage, you, different sensations might feel good at different parts of your body, whereas others don't anymore. Um, so any kind of vibrators can really help with that. And it can be uh, easier. Instead of having to thrust an entire body, you can then just use a toy. Um, of course, this can also be a loan, and that could save somebody a lot of energy by using a toy. Um, I think it's important to talk. I think that's the most important one. Um, be open with your communication, say what it is that you desire, what it is that you need, what doesn't feel good anymore. Uh, what kind of intimacy do you, are you seeking for? Um, and be flexible with one another. Um, that's the easiest way to do it. Sex at the end of the day, it's of closeness. It's a way to, um, become together and, uh, yeah, feel pleasure. There shouldn't be too much pressure behind it. And if you've got a specific situation, I think it is also important. We can speak to healthcare professionals about this. You can go and talk to your um, nurses or oncologists or whoever. Um, they actually should know about this. It might be an awkward subject, but go for it. Yeah, as uh, we mentioned before, if you are friends in our relations, it is very true the sentence that in every sufferance there is an opportunity you just have to see it and if a couple is friends they can explore new uh, possibilities opportunities yeah. except uh, only the challenging uh, issues of cancer related uh, issues sarah thank you very much for thank you so much your explanations for your uh, accepting uh, our invitation and uh, hopefully we'll see again maybe on yeah. other subjects related to sexual health in adults with cancer thank you very much yeah. okay. thank you so much don't forget to like comment share and subscribe to onka daily on youtube hit the bell icon to stay updated